This is Giovanna Le Castro. I'm a fourth year medical student and this is my presentation on multiple pregnancy. So some definitions to start with. When we talk about twins, so we talk about two zygotes. Triplets are three zygotes, quadruplets four zygotes. Triplets and quadruplets are far less common than twins, which is why I will focus on twins in this presentation. There are two types of twins. Um, they can be dizygous or fraternal twins meaning they come from two different zygotes or two different eggs fertilized by different sperm, forming uh, two genetically different pregnancies happen happening in one uterus at the same time. Dizygous twins are more common than monozygous, monozygous twins. Monozygous are also identical twins, and they come from the division of one single already developing embryo. Because they come from one embryo, they will be genetically identical. Triplets are most commonly trizygotic, so three zygotes, but they can also come from dizygotic twins in which one zygote splits into two and forms two genetically identical zygotes and one genetically different zygote. This is just one example of how triplets can vary, but like I said, I'll be focusing on twins in this presentation. In terms of risk factors, there are some risk factors that you can have with dizygous or monozygous twins that will make you more likely to have those. So race, increasing maternal age and parity, so multiparous women are more likely to have dizygous twins than nulliparous women. Some genetic factors, so having twins in the family, and IVF especially when there's a double embryo transfer. If both of the embryos are transferred into one uterus and both of them are successfully um, implanted into the endometrium, that means that that woman will become pregnant with dizygous twins. Uh, monozygous twins are uh, usually a random event. It's a random division of the zygote into two. There is a slightly higher risk of that happening in IVF, but certainly IVF doesn't play nearly as big of a role in monozygosity as it does in dizygosity. Chorionicity is also really important to talk about, and it needs to be established to determine whether the amniotic sac and or the placenta are shared between the twins. This will determine a uh, possible further complications throughout the pregnancy, either maternal or fetal complications, which is why chorionic chorionicity has to be determined. Um, chorionicity uh, is determined by when, during the embryonic development, the zygote divides. And I'll talk a bit in more detail about that later. But for now, um, just to understand what chorionicity really is about, this is, in, this is a, an illustration of the placenta the chorion, so the fetal part of the placenta, and the amnion, and these two fetuses are separated by the amnion, so they are in physically different amniotic spaces, but they are sharing the same placenta, and therefore sharing the same nutrient resource. Uh, in terms of um, the types of chorionicity there are. This is a photo from the Obstetrics and Gynecology at a Glance book available online on Blackboard. You can have dichorionic diamniotic twins, so two chorions, two placentas, two amniotic sacs. You can also have monochorionic, one placenta, diamniotic, two amniotic sacs, Monochorionic, one placenta, monoamniotic, one amniotic sac. The earlier in the embryonic development the, the, the zygote divides, the more likely it is that each um, embryo will have their own placenta and their own amniotic sac. The later they divide, the more likely it is that they will have to share the placenta and or share the amniotic sac or even be conjoined twins. This is just a written explanation of um, chorionicity. If uh, you want to look at that later, um, just to make things a bit more clear. 
Uh, in terms of the assessment of um, multiple pregnancy, you cannot determine cognitive chorionicity through signs and symptoms, but you can suspect multiple pregnancies through signs and symptoms. So it's more likely that women will have hyperemesis gravidarum if they are pregnant with multiples due to the increased circulation of beta HCG in the, in the maternal blood. The uterus will also be larger than expected for their gestational age and be palpable before 12 weeks and usually in a single pregnancy, um, the uterus is not palpable before 12 weeks. You might be able to feel more than one fetal pole on abdominal palpation and two fetal heart rates may be heard on auscultation. The best tool we have to determine chorionicity and multiple pregnancy is the ultrasound scan. The chorionicity is more accurately determined if the scan is done before 14 weeks of pregnancy. Luckily, um, during the dating scan, the ultrasound dating scan, it's usually done between 8 and 13 weeks. So that's, um, that makes it more accurate to determine the chorionicity of the twins. Um, so these are some uh, ultrasound signs you may, t you may find to differentiate between um, the chorionicity as well as zygosity of the twins. If they have different sexes, it's more likely that they are, well, if different sexes, they will be dizygous. Um, the presence of the lambda sign, so this upside down Y will indicate the separation of the chorionic and amniotic sacs, so that will make dichorionic diamniotic twins. And the absence of the lambda sign and presence of the T sign will um, indicate monochorionic diamniotic twins. The management of a multiple pregnancy is very important, and um, that's because of the complications that come with a multiple pregnancy. These are some of the maternal complications of multiple pregnancy. Miscarriage, hyperemesis gravidarum, which I talked about previously, preeclampsia, anemia due to higher plasma volume and even higher fetal iron requirements. Then a single pregnancy, postpartum hemorrhage, antenatal hemorrhage, diabetes, and the preterm premature rupture of fetal membranes. Some of the fetal complications of multiple pregnancies can be prematurity, polyhydramnios and oligohydramnios, which I'll talk about later, congenital malformation, malformations, intrauterine growth restriction, or IUGR, co-twin death, discordant growth between twins, so one twin grows more than the other, and specifically in twins sharing the same placenta and amniotic sac, they will be at even higher risk of spontaneous miscarriage, malformations, IUGR, prematurity, twin-to-twin -twin transfusion syndrome, which I'll talk about later, and cord entanglement. In uh, monochorionic twins specif specifically, not only are they more at risk of twin-to-twin -twin transfusion, transfusion syndrome, but also of a twin anemia polycythemia sequence, twin reversed arterial perfusion, and twin embolization syndrome. They are also at risk of uh, some intrapartum complications such as cord prolapse, twin interlocking, and they uh, are at high risk of perinatal morbidity of the second twin in vaginal delivery. So this is why all multiple pregnancies are at high risk and should be consultant-led. There is usually the uh, regular use of iron and folate supplements due to the higher risk of anemia. If the patient has additional risks for preeclampsia, they might be put on prophylaxis with aspirin. Knuckle translucency test is more, unre more unreliable in multiple pregnancy as well. And if these twins share the same placenta or are triplets or quadruplets, then they might need a referral to the specialist fetal medicine team um, in addition to obviously consultant lead care. Uh, the antenatal management involves more regular ultrasound scans to check for fetal growth as well as fetal well-being and uh, amniotic uh, fluid levels. Dichorionic twins will be checked um, every four weeks from starting from 24 weeks of gestation and monochorionic twins um, every two weeks starting from, starting from 18 weeks gestation. Uh, the maternal blood is also monitored for the full blood count due to risk of anemia. 
monitor maternal blood pressure due to risk of preeclampsia. And if the mother has any additional risks of uh, gestational diabetes, uh, she will have a glucose tolerance test. Glucose tolerance test. They will also be offered an induction uh, at 37, 38 weeks, depending on the trust um, or lower segment cesarean section. Talking about delivery, so vaginal delivery is possible if the first twin is cephalic, but it will need continuous monitoring as well as active management in the third stage of labor. And uh, C-section will be recommended if there is delayed delivery of the second twin. Remember what I mentioned of a higher perinatal morbidity of the second twin in vaginal delivery. So if delivery is delayed, the C-section is recommended as well as in fetal distress of either twin, malpresentation of the second twin after the first twin is delivered, uh, if uh, obviously um, that can't be changed, non-vertex presentation of the first twin, in monoamniotic twins, as well as multiples, so what, triplets or quadruplets or more. Uh, a little bit about twin-to-twin -twin transfusion syndrome can only happen if um, they share the same placenta, so monochorionic twins. It's caused by a vascular anastomosis of the shared placenta, causing the blood flow to uh, flow from one twin to another, making one of them a donor and one of them a recipient. The donor twin will, uh, the amniotic fluid of the donor twin will be uh, volume depleted. And this twin may have anemia, uh, intrauterine growth restriction, oligohydramnios, and dehydration. The recipient twin may be volume overloaded and may develop polycythemia, cardiac failure, uh, and massive polyhydramnios. Both twins will be at risk of intrauterine death and preterm delivery. Twin anemia polycythemia sequence is when there is a difference in the hemoglobin, fetal hemoglobin between um, each between donor and recipient twins without the liquor volume changes seen in uh, TTTS. So uh, even though they have hemoglobin difference, the amniotic fluid is not that difference between not that difference between each. It can cause can be caused by a smaller placental anastomosis than the one that causes TTTS, or it can also be caused by incomplete laser ablation for um, as a treatment for TTTS. Polyhydramnios, a little bit on that, is uh, the excess of amniotic fluid during the gesta gestation. It's caused by some fetal abnormalities, such as GI abnormalities, impaired swallowing, and twin-to-twin -twin transfusion syndrome. Some maternal causes are diabetes, infection. The complications of polyhydramnios can be fetal malposition, umbilical cord prolapse, premature rupture of membranes, uterine contractions, and therefore premature birth. And the treatment for it will be amnio reduction, so draining that excess amniotic fluid, uh, but most importantly, treating the cause of the excess amniotic fluid in the first place. So controlling blood, maternal blood glucose or um, laser ablation for twin-to-twin -twin transfusion syndrome. Oligohydramnios is the opposite. It's a deficiency of amniotic fluid. It can be caused by preeclampsia, placental insufficiency, and placental abruption, or fetal factors such as uh, renal malformation, posterior urethral valves, and chromosomal, chromosomal abnormalities. Some complications of oligohydramnios can be cord compression, IUGR and Porter sequence, and the treatment for it, just as much as you can do the amnio reduction, you can do an amnio infusion through amniocentesis, but most importantly, you'd want to treat the underlying cause of oligohydramnios and of course, consider, consider delivery if um, they are close to term. I hope this helped. Um, thank you for listening.